My name is Maria Cordialos, and I'm the Executive Director of the IGES Institute. Today, we would like to welcome all of you to the IGES Institute XML Basics for NIBRS Implementation. As many of you may or may not be familiar with, the IGES Institute is an organization that has been uh, in good standing for 22 years uh, and is one that often provides uh, training in various policy, operational, and technical components for the practitioner and service provider communities uh, throughout the justice domain. Uh, today's course is one that we um, have been working on for some time, and this community we believe is very familiar with, uh, but needs to sort of touch up on a couple of the nuances that are of benefit to support the NIBRS implementation processes. Uh, given what we believe to be three or 400 individuals that have registered and will ultimately participate in this event, uh, what we typically do with this is we uh, open up the session with maybe six slides on the IGES Institute. So for those that uh, we are new to you, you'll understand why we're at the table and what we have as a history that we bring to contribute to the uh, component. And then we will discuss the particulars of this particular training session. So uh, I will, if you bear with me, uh, share my screen and pull up a couple of slides and put it in presentation mode. And I will ask Tom, my colleague who I will introduce you to, uh, to let me know if we have any problems. All righty then, I'm hoping that everybody sees that in presentation mode. So as I mentioned, the IGES Institute uh, is an organization uh, that has about 22 years uh, in its history. It's known as a nonprofit collaboration network it is one that was originally seeded by the Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance, to originally address and enable and enhance the communication between what were the practitioners within the justice community and the service providers that supported their operational missions. So what were the traditional CAD operators, computer-aided dispatch programs, uh, RMS programs, records management programs? Uh, the intention was to facilitate the dialogue so that outside the procurement processes, there was a better understanding of what the operational priorities were, what the needs were, and what the requirements would be in order to successfully meet the, uh, the operational imperatives and even the product implementation needs uh, for su successful outcomes. How the IGES Institute over a 20 year history has continued to do that successfully is to advocate for and understand all of the policies, all of the processes, and most importantly, the information sharing standards that either exist or that we need to develop in order to enable and facilitate data sharing. Uh, for those of us that have a background in the public safety or justice world, or really from the public sector background, uh, we understand that there are policies on the federal level, at the state levels, at the local levels that sometimes uh, work in harmony, uh, but often do not and may contradict one another or may at least challenge one another. Uh, an understanding of those policies in advance, an understanding of the processes of how different agencies within a jurisdiction, within a state, within a region, and certainly nationally, how they do their jobs in order to accomplish like priorities uh, is important for those of us at the IGES Institute to understand so that we can facilitate implementation at the local and agency level. From a technical perspective, we all understand that the process is the most important thing, but from a technical perspective, it's very important for us to enable efficiently and effectively standards that then enable what is uh, effective data sharing across platforms, across tools, uh, without losing what were initial investments over time from so many agencies. Uh, from the agency level, of course, uh, no agency can rip and replace at a moment's notice, and certainly not at the pace that technology replaces itself and improves over time of late. Therefore, the connectivity and the ability to be able to share information and data from various uh, systems, 
platforms, et cetera, can only be enabled with standards across those areas. The goals, objectives, mission, and outcomes of the IDIS Institute over its 22 year history has really developed and been responsive to the critical issues, events, catastrophes, um, and world events that have happened since 1999. Uh, whether it was 9-11, whether it was Katrina, uh, whether it was technology, whether it was unfortunately the issues that happened at a school venue, uh, whether it is the ongoing issues that continue to face us uh, all too often with uh, police reform, justice reform, et cetera, uh, and even the pandemic. Life has changed uh, extraordinarily, uh, not only on a decade basis, but almost on an annual basis. And public sector domains cannot keep up at that pace. Uh, therefore, it is important for us to be able to enable and to meet those needs uh, in order to, again, support the operational priorities, those policies, and ultimately the data sharing tools. The IDIS Institute therefore focuses in several different domains that are intrinsic to its name, which is the Integrated Justice Information Sharing Systems uh, Institute. And again, we use IDIS because we have far expanded beyond the justice domain, but keeping our roots in law enforcement and justice and public safety and emergency management uh, and expanding to Homeland Security and Health and Human Services and education and school safety and even critical infrastructure. Uh, all of them have a link these days back to justice because of course, as the world becomes smaller, as our need for data access to make wise and intelligent choices become even more important, uh, so too does the need to have data available to us quickly and, and available to us efficiently. Um, the secret sauce to the IDIS Institute is the collaboration of its broader community. Uh, the IGIS community that uh, we often refer to as the federal, state, county, local, regional, private sector, public sector, academics, uh, research organizations, standards development organizations. Uh, there are no groups that we would not welcome at the table because this uh, information sharing challenge, frankly, is so massive and so critical uh, to our everyday lives that we welcome uh, different perspectives, different views, different uh, skills brought to the table. The collaboration between all those partners happens not only at the executive level between our board of directors and a board of advisors that we are in the process of constituting to represent the private sector and public sector respectively, uh, but then at our uh, advisory tables, our mission specific advisory tables and committees, which then speak to law enforcement, criminal justice, so that's the local areas and then the federal uh, law enforcement uh, communities, courts, corrections uh, for traditional justice communities, emergency communications, the PSAPs of yesteryear and of today and how vastly they have changed from receiving calls and dispatching resources to becoming many real-time crime centers, uh, data analytics for uh, its uh, self-explanatory meaning, yet, dependent upon the mission, whether it's a fusion center or real-time crime center, an agency trying to figure out the patterns within a community, data analytics can mean so many different things to so many different individuals. And ultimately the information uh, technology advisory committee, which then speaks to the emerging technologies that can enable data sharing across different platforms and domains. Finally, the IGIS Institute is known for its uh, provision of services. So that could be programmatic management services, uh, training and technical assistance of which this webinar and this training module is a perfect example. Uh, our biannual events that speak to our uh, community forum, which we'll have one in June in the Austin, Texas region, as well as then our symposium, which will be held in the October timeframe in the uh, Metro DC area, and then of course many, many topic specific summits uh, that we bring to the community in order to address what are critical and uh, uh, time sensitive issues. So cybersecurity issues, CGIS policy security issues, uh, many different topics that then are of critical value uh, to the uh, constituents that we serve. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna speak specifically to what is today's 
event or today's webinar. Uh, the IDIS Institute had the pleasure to be part of a broader team uh, that was sponsored by the Bureau of Justice Statistics, as well as the FBI, in order to support what was initially targeting the transition of uh, summary, summary reporting from UCR to NIBRS reporting for incident-based reporting, uh, focusing on 400 sample agencies. And this was to speak to all of those process issues, policy issues, implementation support, et cetera. And of course, it was about uh, reaching and realizing statistically relevant data thresholds. Uh, ultimately, those same two sponsors uh, saw the value of continuing the team and in sponsoring, of course, the transition and support where possible from a funding perspective uh, for the many other agencies nationwide that, of course, represent an, a to total number of about 18,000. Uh, that team uh, was primed, uh, led by RTI, Research Technology Incorporated, and uh, several different uh, membership organizations, uh, value organizations, research organizations to include uh, IACP, PERF, Search, ASUCRP, and several others, including IGIS, were at the table. Uh, the core provision of services throughout what was a, probably uh, starting in 2013, nearly a 10 year effort, so let's say eight to nine years, uh, was truly the soups and, soup to nuts on how to uh, enable and affect a successful implementation at the agency level. This uh, provision and focus on XML training in order to support the NIBRS implementation is one last example of that broader program uh, that I just continues to support and is coming to a near close. That in, no mean, that in no way means that support from those sponsoring agencies from those participating membership groups and research groups and uh, entities are not still available now and far into the future. Uh, it's just one that we're proud to say that a part of that NCSX program, National Criminal Statistics Exchange Program, uh, that we're proud that this is one more deliverable that we have in the suite of services that is available not only to the private sector, but to the public sector practitioners uh, that are seeking to implement successfully their NIBRS program. To that end, there was no better resource to bring to the table uh, than a, a, a great colleague for many years, Tom Carlson, who is of Tom Carlson Consulting. Uh, many of you who have been in this business, uh, just as I for many decades have, have uh, worked with Tom on many different standards-based programs, uh, specifically NEEM that comes to mind, uh, many governance issues, uh, many program-related issues, uh, many policy-related issues, always to the benefit and the development of training and packages that made a difference to the practitioners, to the public domain, to the private sector that sought to meet those operational priorities and truly affect the change at their agency level. This program today is going to be one of a couple of different modules that Tom will speak to us about. Uh, but just so that you know, from a housekeeping perspective, I'm going to toss it over to Tom and let him do a little intro on this effort. Uh, we will be available for questions, uh, but I thank you from the IDIS Institute. I thank you from the NCSX program. I thank you from our community that supports NIBRS nationwide. And uh, Tom, I'll toss it over to you and be here a couple of seconds and then bow out, but be here for questions. Great, thank you. So hello, and thanks for all that, Maria. Um, I'm Tom Carlson, uh, Tom Carlson, uh, Tom Carlson Consulting. I, I am Tom Carlson Consulting, it's just me. Um, but we've got this, um, this, this great, I hope you like it, XML course for you. It's broken down into three parts. Uh, part number one is what you're gonna watch as part of this webinar, and that is introduction to XML itself. So it's, it's just shy of an hour long, but it's all about how XML works, how things fit together um, from just the XML perspective. Parts two and three, uh, which will be made available online, but we're not doing in the webinar because that's another um, that's another hour and 45 minutes and nobody wants to sit for nearly three hours um, and listen to, listen to me talk about XML. But parts two and three are XML schema, which is a way of defining what an XML document looks like. So when you look at a, at a NIBRS exchange and you wonder, 
how do I know which pieces are supposed to go where, other than looking at an example, the XML schema is where that's defined. And then th those NIBR schemas are built upon NEEM, which is a framework for building standards, which is exactly what, what they've done with NEEM, is build a standard based on it. So parts two and three are kind of um, uh, intermediary, intermediate, intermediate XML schema. Um, and then part three is kind of the advanced XML schema. A lot of XML schema courses don't cover everything XML schema can do, um, but NIBRS uses some of those things uh, that are fancy XML schema that you don't always get instruction on. And so we have a specific third part that covers that. So part one today is XML and parts two and three will be made available online. And those are the XML schema, um, kind of intermediate, beginning intermediate and advanced at the end. Um, but you're gonna wanna watch parts two and three, I think, to get an idea for how things are defined and why they work the way they work. Now, the way this webinar is going to work is we're going to be showing you um, the first hour. We're going to show you part one. It's pre-recorded, so I won't be talking live. You'll hear me, uh, but you'll hear me pre-recorded. Uh, so you will just watch the video. I will be here, but I will be muted. I'm going to turn the camera off. I will be here to answer questions uh, via chat while the video is playing. So if you have questions uh, during the next hour while you're watching the video, please put them in chat. Don't, don't ask them via the webinar. Um, put them in chat. I will answer questions in chat if it's a question that needs a longer answer. At the end of the pre-recorded video, I'll get on uh, like I am right now, uh, live via, via my, my webcam right here, and I can answer those questions more in more depth. I can also answer any questions that you want to you know, ask aloud. I know some people don't like to ask questions aloud. Some people do. Uh, so we're trying to meet you, meet you both ways here. And you can type them in chat. You can ask them aloud in an hour from now. Um, and that's what we'll do with the last 45 minutes of our, our two-hour block is basically deal with any questions you have. Maybe a peek ahead at some of the XML schema stuff that's of particular importance um, that isn't in that first hour. Uh, so with that, um, I'm going to turn off my video and I'm going to mute my microphone and we're going to start the video. And again, for the next hour, please ask your questions in chat um, and I will answer them in chat. And then when the video is over in an hour, then we'll do more live. Welcome to XML Basics, XML and XML Schema for Niverse Exchanges. To start, let's have a quick introduction. Why does NIBRS use XML? Why do you even need to know about it? Why do you need to have a basic understanding of XML? Because historically, NIBRS has used flat files to exchange information. They've used flat files. Everybody's used to flat files. Everybody is accustomed to reading and troubleshooting flat file issues. So why change? Why go to something like XML? Well, you know, some of the reasons are it can be cumbersome to translate these files, and flat files are typically associated with legacy systems. Flat files just aren't what current day systems use anymore, and there are a lot of problems with them. Flat files can be very brittle. Um, it, it's really easy for a flat file system to break because there's no self descriptions in any of the data. It's just a bunch of fields and you better hope you got them right. You better hope they're in the right order. Validating flat files is very limited, so it can be hard to find mistakes. How do you know if I'm missing a field or I've got an extra field and how do you check for all that kind of things? Flat files can be limited in ability. There's no way to represent structure, and a lot of our data today is structural in nature. And there's no way to represent that structure in a flat file. There's also no way to handle dynamic data. So for example, you may have some thing that you're trying to exchange information about, and there may be one of them, just one, or there may be multiple. Flat files don't handle that very well. You kind of have, you're, you're stuck with however many fields you're stuck with. So you lack that ability to be dynamic. Um, basic, also other things like you have trouble in IBERS resubmitting single incidents for error correction if you're using it flat files. It's just hard to provide the information and the structure back and forth to make things happen quickly and easily. Uh, and the thing is, again, you know, flat files, that's legacy stuff. Uh, we've come a long way. XML isn't new. Um, in fact, to a lot of people, XML is an older technology and some people think of it as almost a legacy system. But 
XML is very, very well supported everywhere. XML is an extremely well supported and widespread technology um, that has a lot of capabilities that flat files simply don't have. So to address the limitations of flat files, the FBI and the state programs have ramped up to XML submissions as a preferred format. Now, XML is designed for computers to parse and understand. So primarily, they're for computers to make sense of, but while still being meaningful to just a normal person looking at them. However, that said, if you're not already familiar with XML and XML concepts, it can be a struggle to do that understanding. And if you have to create the XML to meet specific rules, that can be different or very difficult um, without understanding the XML concepts behind it. So because of all that, because of this shift to XML and the need for people to understand the XML concepts in order to create these XML-based Nibris exchanges, uh, we decided you needed some training to help do that. So what we're going for here is get you a background in XML to make it easier for you to support Nibris using, using XML, just to understand some XML so that you can do the Nibris stuff correctly. <clears throat> so let's get right down into that. First, let's look at an overview of the NIBRS IEPD structure. Now, IEPD is an information exchange package documentation. This is a concept created by a model called the NEAM, uh, or just NEAM, uh, used to stand for National Information Exchange Model. Now it's just kind of a term of art, NEAM, and um, you define exchanges by leveraging NEAM. NIBRS uses uh, NEAM uh, as the base for defining its exchanges. Now, this isn't training about NEAM. Um, if you want more information about NEAM, there is training out there. Uh, you'll recognize the voice. It's, it's, it's my voice because uh, I've done the NEAM training. So just search for NEAM and training, uh, N-I-E-M, and you'll find all stuff all about that. But you don't need to have NEAM training just to do the NIBRS exchange. Um, we're going to cover the NIBRS exchange. We're going to cover XML, but we're going to use NIBRS as the example so that you can see these things in place. So let's look at our example. And there's a lot of different sample NIBRS exchanges out there, but I like incident with multiple offenses because it does, uh, it covers a lot of the bases that we want to cover in terms of, of XML concepts. So let me go back quick to the list here. There are some important sections. We're not going to go through every little bit. The idea here is to teach you about XML so that when you see the XML you understand it rather than teaching you exactly the NIBRS exchange format. Um, but we're going to use the exchange format as our example. So hopefully they all work together. You got some important sections. You've got the submission itself. You can go back over uh, to our example. What I'm going to do a lot in this training is I'm going to flip between the materials and this example so you can see these things. Here's the submission itself. It's at the very top level. We're going to learn more about what that is as we go, um, but that's that's the submission object. and it's, it's the wrapper for everything else. It's the whole thing. It's the submission. Along with the submission, there is a message metadata section. So let's go take a look at the example. And indeed, here's our message metadata section right here. And that has a bunch of things inside of it. We're going to cover again. Now, the hard part about XML training is that there's so many different concepts, but I can't teach you them all at once. I have to teach them one at a time. So some things you'll see, but you won't understand what they are until we get to that particular topic. So you just have to hang in there. Everything in here, you know, we're going to cover all the concepts, um, but it, it, it has to be done sequentially. And so that just means some things you're going you're gonna to wonder about until we get to them. So it's got a message metadata. You'll see these things indented underneath. And those are various different objects that are specific to the message metadata. So some of those things are there's date and time stamps. Um, there's IDs. There's versioning information, and there's information about the submitting organization. So there's all that sort of information in, in, the, um, in the message metadata. And in fact, here they all were. Here's the date timestamps, message identification. Um, there's a version that I didn't mention. And here's the submitting organization. There's also the report itself. So you've got the report itself, and that has really the, 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 the bulk of, of the submission. So it has the report itself with category codes, the date of the report, the reporting organization, things like that. We can take a quick look. So here's the report, and it's got uh, category codes and action codes and the report date, reporting agency. So this is all stuff about the report. And then it has other objects that are a part of that report. So there's an incident in there with IDs, date stamps, clearance information, things like that. One or more offenses are going to be in there. 
one or more locations are going to be in there. Uh, offenses are going to have UCR and other codes, going to have force information as part of the offense. Locations are going to have category codes. There's going to be one or more people involved. Um, they're going to have age and race and residency and sex information. It's going to be one or more victims with category codes and injuries, um, one or more subjects, and then there's going to be relationships between these objects. And how all that works is all stuff we're going to cover as we go through the training. Again, let's go back to the XML itself and look, and see some of those things are there. So we talked about the stuff about the report itself, which is all in this header part. Um, here's the incident we've talked about with an ID and a date. And there's, um, oh, here is some more clearance codes, clearance dates, things like that. Now, again, this is just a quick overview. I'm not trying to teach you every little bit of this particular document. Um, I just want to show you generally a walkthrough so you can see the kind of things that are in there. And we'll learn more about it as we go. So here's the offense. Remember, so there's, there could be multiple offenses, and indeed there are. There's one offense there, and there's one offense here. They've got codes, 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 uh, offense factors with a code, whole lot of codes, uh, force factor codes, and uh, in a, a, a Boolean for um, offense attempted. And then we get down to location. Here's a location with a category code. And the items involved, I didn't list items up above. That's another thing that can be in diverse things. And, um, and then here's the person. And the person's got an age down here, and ethnicity, and index codes, and, oh, and residence code, and a sex code. Second person here, and a third person here. And then we got a victim. And you got a victim. What's this role of person? You'll find out what this and this ref thing is. We're gonna to get to that later. Um, it's important, but it's, it's an advanced topic. A sequence number, which victim is this, things like that, injury information with a category code, um, another category code for the victim themselves, aggravated assault homicide factor codes, and a second victim, a subject. And then I said there are all these relationships and these are all the relationships here. And these, these are things that all hook everything above together. So we're gonna cover all these different things and how they'll work in detail. Again, not, not each element as an element in detail, but teach you the XML behind it so that then you can understand, you know, what is this and what is this for and what does it do? And the same thing down here, you know, what does this do? And those are the things you'll learn as part of the training so that then you can make sense of this yourself and see how it's all put together. I wanna to teach you how the XML works not teach you this specific XML here. Because guess what? If I teach you just this XML here, that's brittle. Again, that's almost like a flat file. That's I've learned one thing, and if anything that one thing changes, I'm gonna be lost, which is why we're teaching you XML and XML schema, which you'll learn about as we go. We're teaching you XML and XML schema so that you can understand this sort of XML and utilize it and create it and consume it and understand how it works instead of a, a memorization process of how this particular document is set up. So let's go back to the training materials and let's start actually talking about what XML is. So XML is a means of making information self-describing. You saw that as we were here. You know, what are these different things? Well, this is message metadata. How do we know? It tells us, it's in the element name. Um, and this is a very big important step in something beyond flat files. If you just see a flat file, you have no idea what any of that means unless you get to see somewhere what it all means. But XML has that information described in the XML itself. So you wrap different pieces of data in tags that describe the data. They'll give, it'll give each piece of data a name and it'll let you collect related pieces of information together into objects. It shares roots with HTML and it looks very similar, but it's pickier than HTML. HTML lets you be very loose with what you do. And anybody who's done some, some HTML, HTML uh, knows you can be kind of fast and loose with your HTML. XML is very picky about you, how you format things, but that's for a reason. That ensures that the important data is organized and described correctly so that entities on either end can understand what everything means. So you wanna have rules for how things fit together and rules for what they look like so that when I send you information or you send me information, we both know what we all mean about it and everything is formatted in a way <clears throat> that a computer can um, read through it and parse it and make sense of it. 
You ever know how sometimes a web page looks screwy in a different in in one browser but looks fine in another? And that's because HTML is 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 loose with its rules. XML XML can be is is used a lot for exchanging information. You really want to have it right. So in order to have it right, you got to be kind of picky about the rules. Also different is that HTML is mostly about formatting documents. Uh, for people to view. And XML is generally more about describing information so that a system can produce and consume it in an intelligent fashion. Um, so it's not just a document. You have a document if the formatting is a little screwed up, that's okay. That's not okay when you're exchanging data. When you're exchanging data, it's got to be right. What I send has got to be what you receive and it's got to be understandable at each end. So that's what XML helps buy you, um, and especially over things like flat files. So XML schema then, which we're also going to cover in this, is a related technology that defines what XML documents need to look like. So first we're gonna look at the rules for XML. So what a generic XML document needs to look like. <clears throat> and then once we have that down, we'll look at XML schema, which is kind of the next step in defining exactly what the different elements need to be. So when we look at our example, this thing having angle brackets around it, and this having angle brackets around it, and this whole thing being nested inside of this thing with another thing down here that matches it, sort of, that's XML. That this has to say message data, and this has to say message date time, and this has to be the form of a date string, and it's ISO standard string. Um, that's XML schema. So all these little angle brackets and how the big pieces fit together and are organized, that's XML. XML schema is more about what does that element need to be? What does that element's name need to be? What kind of data is this? What kind of data is this? Those kind of questions. Now we're gonna cover them both. By the end of, the, of this uh, training, you'll have a pretty good handle on both XML and XML schema. So XML schema defines what the XML documents need to look like. And the combination of the two provide you with a bunch of features. You get a hierarchical organization of information where information is organized in a hierarchy. And we'll see examples of that as we go. You get sophisticated data typing. You get support for a variety of strings, numbers, dates, booleans, and even code tables. And as, as you saw in the example, there's tons of code tables in Nibris, right? We live or die by code tables. Code tables allow us to sanitize data and make sure that the value you're sending is just one of a, of a valid have a set of valid data it can be, and the thing you sent is, is one of the valid options uh, for that code. Uh, you can do all that in XML and XML schema. You get object-oriented types that can be used as a base for more specialized types. Now, you strictly, this is getting deeper into XML schema, which we'll get to. Um, you don't really have to know this to make the NIBRS XML document, but it's good to know to understand why the document works the way it does. So again, we don't want to teach you just, here's how you make this particular document. We want to give you the skills so that you understand how the document is created. You understand um, how to make it yourself so that when you're doing something just a little bit different than the example, you can handle it. So that's why we're going to teach you a lot of stuff here. Um, there's cardinality constraints. So I can say how many of a thing another thing can hold. And then you've also got the ability to reference across the hierarchy because a lot of things in life are not hierarchically organized. And sometimes it's good to be able to say, I got this thing over here and I got another thing somewhere else and I want to hook them together. And we do that. We do that in Iverse a lot. So you're going to see all of that. This is all XML and XML schema combined together. And by the end of this training, you'll have a very good idea about how that all works. So what follows is first an introduction to XML itself. We're going to talk about XML, um, just how the elements are set up, uh, the rules of XML, and then we're going to delve into XML schema, which will give us additional tools to be able to define what a document looks like. And the combination of XML and XML schema is what tells us what this example document needs to look like. It tells us what the elements need to be, how they need to be organized, and what kind of data they can hold. So. Hold tight as we go through and do all that. So let's start with element tag names. XML elements are defined by tags. They're pieces of information. Uh, pieces of information are surrounded by these tags. There's an opening tag and there's a closing tag. In its simplest form, a starting tag is an open angle bracket followed by the name of the element followed by a closing angle bracket. So here's one right here. This is just a sample and not actually out of 
out of the Niverse example, but it's a very easy, here's a first name, um, and it, it defines a name, it defines a first name. So this is the opening tag. It's an angle bracket, some sort of name, closing angle bracket. Then at the end is a closing tag. Very, very similar, except for it has a slash in here. So it's angle bracket slash first name, closing angle bracket. Now note this is a forward slash, not a backslash. If you're a Mac person or a Linux or Unix person, you're very familiar with forward slashes in computer things. If you're a Windows person, you may be more familiar with backslashes. Um, these are forward slashes. So if you don't get it right, it'll be wrong. It has to be a forward slash. So that's just important to keep in mind. So this is an opening tag. And the name of the tag is first name. And this is the closing tag. And this matches. This first name here matches this first name here. They go together, they're a pair. And what they surround is the information they define. And in this case, it's the string Fred. So what is the, it's basically what is the value of the first name? The first name is Fred. And that's what this whole set of XML does. Now there are some rules for the tag names. There's not a ton, but there are some rules. Number one, they can contain Letters, numbers, and other certain characters. Um, so what I mean by other certain characters are accented non-English stuff. Uh, you know, E's with, E's with accent one way, O with the other way, A with the other way, uh, with the first way. Um, some languages have a lot of these. Um, Hungarian, which I'm very vaguely familiar with because uh, I did a project in Hungary. Hungarian has a lot of extra letters. Hungarian and Finnish, actually, are... Um, essentially phonetic languages, where there is one way and one way only to pronounce the letters, which means they need a lot more than 26. And so they have a lot of extra letters with accents. It's okay to use those in XML, um, but it may not be supported by all implementations. So all the NIBR stuff in the tag names, those are all going to be just your normal ASCII characters, A through Z, and maybe some numbers in there. Uh, you can also have dashes. You can, um, you can have dashes, you can have periods, you can have colons. In general, you shouldn't. Um, and we'll find out, especially for colons, as we get down to an advanced topic called namespaces. You can put those in, though. Uh, typically, you avoid them, but they're not illegal. Uh, colons are for namespaces, a topic for the end, so you don't want to use those either. To be safe, you stick with letters. You stick with um, ASCII letters, A through Z, <clears throat> upper and lower, um, and numbers in, in maybe a dash. If you really need to break things up, typically you don't. A lot of times it's not required, but a lot of times in XML you will see camel casing. Um, this is upper camel case. It's called camel casing because you capitalize the first letter of each word um, to help break them up. So even though it's one long string, you can see uh, that it's a first name. It is, it's the two words stuck together with that camel casing and it, it forms humps. That's why it's called camel casing. This is upper camel case where the first letter is capitalized. There's also lower camel case where you camel case everything except uh, the first letter and neither does that, although not heavily, the lower camel case, it's mostly upper camel case, and we'll see examples as we go. But the cases, they are case sensitive. So this first name here is not the same as this first name here. They are not the same. So you need to keep that in mind. The capitalization matters. Um, generally, you probably don't want to have both a first name and a first name all lowercase. It can be confusing. But when you do these examples, and you see our examples here, you know, this has to be report header with a capital R and a capital H. You do any other capitalization, it's going to be wrong. It's not going to be the same element name, and it will be wrong. And NIPR systems will not be able to consume this correctly. So it's important to get that correct. Um, also, um, can't have spaces in the names. So tag names can't have spaces. So this can't be first space name. It can be first underscore name if you want, but not first space name. And then this is a weird one. They can't start with XML in any capitalization form. And this includes lowercase x, capital M, lowercase l. Uh, they're just not allowed. Those are reserved. Um, I don't think they're actually ever used yet in XML, but X, the XML standard reserves those for the use of XML itself. So your elements cannot start with XML in any capitalization form. They, they just can't. So that's really simple. That's the element tag names. And they're, they're quite easy to deal with. They're just angle brackets with the description of the tag as a name in between the angle brackets. You got an opening one, you got a closing, oh, an opening one, you got a closing one, 
and you've got some data in between that that it's defining. Here we got a first name. First name is Fred. <clears throat> but elements don't just hold chunks of information. They can also hold other elements, and that starts forming a hierarchy. So let's take a look at that a little bit. So again, this is out of our example, but elements can hold other elements, and that forms a hierarchy. It's a very basic feature of XML um, and a lot of other languages, too. XML is not unique in primarily organizing things in hierarchies like this. JSON does this. YAML does this, if you're familiar with either of those. Um, they're both simpler than XML, although they also lack the full power of XML. Um, XML's got a lot of power, but some complexity comes along with that. Uh, so, you know, a lot of different ways of exchanging and defining information, put things in a hierarchy. Um, XML has done it for an awful, awful long time. So what we have here is just a very shortened version of the example. But now we know that these angle brackets, that this is an opening tag, and there's a match and closing tag down here. It's a start of a report and the end of a report. But instead of holding a string, it holds two more objects. It holds this report header object, which goes all the way down to here. And it holds an incident object, which goes all the way down to here. Now, in the full example, there's a lot more, right? But I, I find it useful to basically carve down the big example into smaller ones to show some of these different things. So the report has a report header object inside of it. Here is the opening tag for a report header. Here's the closing tag. And then it has an incident object. That's the opening incident tag. Here is the closing incident tag. But each of these has things inside of it. The report header has a NIBRS reporting category code element inside of it. So here's the opening tag for a NIBRS reporting category code. And here is the closing tag for a NIBRS report category code. And this one holds data, the group A incident report. That's a code from a code table. But that, that's just a string. It's just a string. So the incident tags, there's the beginning incident, there's the ending incident. They surround this activity date object. It's got an activity date opening tag and an activity date closing tag. And then inside that is a date time with a timestamp. This is an ISO timestamp. It's date and then the letter T and then a time. Um, it's a standard format. Um, personally, I think it's the one, this is the one true way to do a date. Um, I know here in the US, we usually do month, day, year, and pretty much everywhere else does day, month, year. And if you just do year, month, date, there's no ambiguity. It's, it's the best date format. Um, if you've got a bunch of dates, they'll sort correctly alphabetically. Um, so the whole argument over, should it be day, month, year, or month, day, year? No, 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 it should be year, month, date. It's, it's really the best date format. And it's what XML and XML schema use as a default date format. So that's the string here. This is just saying, hey, at 10 o'clock, in the morning, this is 24 hour time here as well for the time part, um, on May 1st, 1920, uh, 2022. Um, and so this forms a hierarchy. You got a report inside of it, it's got a report header, inside of that is a NIBRS report category code. It also has an incident, inside of which is an activity date, inside of which is the date time, inside of which is a string. And the same for the code here, a string inside. How do we know all that? Ha <laughs> ha, that's the XML schema stuff. Uh, we're gonna get to that. Uh, right now, we're just looking at it as XML though. It forms a hierarchy and we have a little graph here uh, to show it. You've got a report, that report has a report header object and NIBRS report, and NIBRS report category code. Also has an incident, the incident has an activity date inside and that has a date time inside of that. So you can see some of the elements hold other elements. We call them parent-child relationships. Um, so you've got the report element is the parent of report header and incident. And in turn, those are children elements of report. Um, report header and incident are children, but they also have children of their own. So report header is the parent of report of NIBRS report category code. Incident is a parent of activity date. And of course, conversely, Category code here is a child of report header, activity date is a child of incident, and activity date is a parent of date time, and date time is a child of activity date. And some people even do, you know, the good grandfather or grandparent things, or um, report is the grandfather of report category code. It gets a little silly by that point. But these, um, these descriptions of parent and child um, are used heavily in XML. If you're actually doing the creation or the consumption of XML um, in, a, in a basically in a coding environment, you will often utilize uh, the terms parent and child. For example, I may 
pull this whole chunk of XML into a development environment and then ask it for all the children of the report object. And it'll tell me it's a header and it's an incident. So that parent and child, you know, that's not just my descriptive terms. Those are kind of the terms that are, that are used in XML development to, to basically describe these relationships. So you know, that's, it forms this hierarchy. And um, you've got all the same relationships it just back and forth. They're all relative. Reports to the parent of a report header and report in, and incident. And it just goes up and down both ways. <clears throat> if you pull back one level, though, and you see a broader example, you'll see that the report is a child of submission. Let's go look at the full example and take a look at that. So here is our report. Now, again, that example in the materials is a really carved down version of this, right? Um, but here's the report, and it is a child of the submission up here. And if we went down further, there was the activity down here as well, or the incident. And you can see I carved it down to just activity date there and the date time. But the incident and the report itself are, um, are both inside of um, this, or not the, not the incident, I'm sorry, the um, report itself is inside of the submission. The submission, however, is not inside of anything. It just exists out there on its own. So that is called the root element. So report is a child of submission. Here's a submission. Report is a child. Submission itself has no parent. It only has children. It's the root of the document. So this time I've done the graph. I flipped it upside down so it forms a tree diagram. Now you see why submission is called a root. I usually think of these things top down, like up here. Um, but if you're thinking of it as a tree, submission is the root element. There is no element encapsulating submission. It's the root of the exchange and it's called the root element. <clears throat> so this is this is um this is common terminology in um like the Unix world. You've got file structures and you've got a root to the file structure and it is the highest level or the lowest, you know, it's it's the top level. It's the when you go all the way back um, as far as you can in the directory tree, that's what you get to. Um, the equivalent on, on Windows is like a C drive or a D drive. Windows is just a little different. But in Unix worlds, um, there's just one starting point for the whole file system. And that's the root. And it's the same thing in XML. It's called the root. And because it forms the root if you draw it as a tree. So submission is the root. It's the parent of report. And report is a child of submission. And then everything else flows from that just as it did above. So you've got this hierarchy. You got a lot of hierarchies because all these elements get related to each other like this. And then you have one root element at the top or bottom, depending on how you like to visualize it. Um, and that is the root element. And there's only one, <clears throat> excuse me, there's only one root element in XML. Other data serializations, JSON, for example, don't have the concept of a root key. So if you're doing JSON, which we're not going to cover at all, um, but if you're doing JSON, you're looking at going, what's a root element? JSON is, is just a set of angle brackets with all the chunks in between. There's no named root. No, there's no name for the wrapper for all the things in JSON. Same with something like YAML. But XML does have this concept of a root element that represents a document itself, in this case, a submission. So we've looked a bit at these elements, but there's one more very basic XML thing to take a look at. And that would be attributes. So we've got the opening and the closing tags, and they can surround other objects or they can surround data. So like here, there's a victim sequence number text, and it surrounds the number two. And there's a victim category code, and it surrounds the letter I. But you can also include um, additional data about a tag inside the tag name itself, inside the opening tag. So in this, and those are called attributes. Those are XML attributes. Um, if you're used to things like UML, different kind of attribute. Um, UML attributes are a different kettle of fish than XML attributes. But in XML, it's a way to add additional simple information to, um, to an object. So in this case, this victim, in addition to having these three objects inside of it also has this little chunk of data attached to it. In this case, it's the name of the attribute is this ID, this S colon, as well as this J colon here and the NC colon here. That's all namespace stuff, advanced topic. We will get to it, so just roll with it for now. But it's got an attribute called ID, and the value of that ID is victim2. Um, the role of person has a thing called a ref, and that's the value of that is person victim2. 
Uh, so these are called attributes. You see them very often in XML. They don't really, the concept doesn't exist in other forms of serialization. Again, like JSON and YAML, um, the idea that you can put attributes on pretty much anything is, is kind of specific to XML. So if you work in other serializations, that is something you, you wouldn't even do. But in XML, you can. You can add these little attributes. Um, in the NIBR stuff, you'll see a lot of them, um, but they don't really hold actual data. Rather, they hold, you'll see these IDs and refs. And here's an ID here, and here's an ID here. And when you get to the bottom, you see a lot of refs. How that all works is, is an advanced topic. We will get to it, but just so you know, um, Nibris doesn't use them a lot. It uses them for a particular specific purpose. But again, I don't want your knowledge to be brittle. You need to know about them in general. They're attributes. They're a way of adding additional information to an object. In this case, an ID called victim2 to this victim object. So suppose here for a better example um, is just one I made up. So here's an oddity about Virginia, because I lived in Virginia for 29 years, and Virginia has this weird oddity in that some cities are independent entities. You know how a city sits inside of a county, right? You got your state, and your state's divvied up into a bunch of counties, and then the cities are scattered all over the state, and every city is in a county, or maybe it's in two counties. It could cross county lines, but cities are always in a county, right? That's not true in Virginia. Um, in Virginia, counties can end at some city limits, and the city itself is not inside any county. Um, just a tidbit of knowledge. But for example, in Virginia, the city of Williamsburg, which is where I, I used to live in Virginia, is um, surrounded by James City County, the very first county. It's the oldest county in the country. James City County on one side, York County on the other side, but it's part of neither. It's not part of either county. The counties end at the Williamsburg city limits. It's an independent city. So if I wanted to represent that, that's the kind of additional information I might want to use an attribute for. So I may have just a city tag and an end city tag in the name of the city is Williamsburg. And then inside I put an attribute for additional information and the status of independent to mark that, hey, Williamsburg is an independent city, not part of a county. Um, I also show this example because you can use double quotes to set off the attributes, but you can also use single quotes to set off attributes as well. Either way, um, they'll both work equally well. If you want to put a single quote in the value, um, then you better surround it with double quotes. And if you want to put double quote in the value, you better surround it with single quotes. Um, the other way to do it is to use HTML attributes. So these are the kind of things like in HTML, if you're going to include a quote mark in something, you don't use the actual quote mark, you use an ampersand, Q-U-O-T, semicolon. And you can do the exact same thing in XML. So it's a way to encode, um, basically encode things like um, a, a double quote inside a string that's surrounded by double quotes. Uh, good development environments will do that for you. Um, so you're, you're writing code that's creating the XML and it will appropriately escape those kind of characters, but just so you understand. Now, sometimes, and we saw an example of this right here. We looked at this roll of stuff. Let me find one. Oh, that's good. I know there's a bunch at the bottom here. Any of these at the bottom. Here's like this roll of person in the subject. And again, we don't, we don't really know what this is all about. But what we do know is that there's no data to this particular one. It's just a roll of person tag. And it's got an attribute. But there's no closing tag. There's no closing roll of person tag. And you remember up top that I said these opening tags always have to have the closing tag. It helps form the structure. What's going on here? Well, here's what's going on here is you could do that just like this. If I don't have any data that goes inside, um, all, all the data for this is just in the attribute here. Or maybe there's just no data at all. Just the existence of this element is significant and I don't actually have any data that goes along with it. <clears throat> well then you can do it like this with the opening tag and then with a closing tag after it. We can do it that way, but you can also, XML will let you do what's called a singleton tag, which is you essentially take this slash, no, literally, not essentially, you literally take the slash, you put it inside at the end of the opening tag. And this is a combination. This is saying, I got a roll of person object, 
but there's nothing in between the opening and closing tag. So I've essentially glommed them together um, and made a short version. And you'll see this all the time in XML. This is just the way you do it. If you're used to something like HTML, you've, you may have seen this for things like horizontal rules. An HR tag puts a horizontal rule in your, um, in your HTML document. Well, there's no data that goes along with that. It just puts a horizontal, puts a horizontal line there. Um, and sometimes you'll see HR tags with the closing slash if somebody's being real careful. So a quick example, uh, just a compare and contrast of elements versus attributes. They look like they do the same thing. And, but when you learn more about XML schema, it, you'll find out that they don't, that there's, are, there are differences between them. So let's just take a little quick comparison of the two. So elements can hold simple data in the form of strings, numbers, booleans, dates, etc. Attributes can do the same thing. They can, oh, they can hold strings. The strings may represent a number or a boolean or a date or what have you, but they're, they're, they're strings. Attributes hold strings. But we've seen above elements can also hold other elements. Right? So an element can hold data or it can hold other elements, and actually it can do both, but you don't do that much when you're exchanging information. Um, but they hold other elements. Attributes, well, attributes can hold simple data in the form of strings, numbers, booleans, dates, etc. Elements can have attributes. So I've got my element, it's got data inside of it, or it can hold other elements inside of it, and it can have attributes put inside that opening tag. Attributes can hold simple data in the form of strings, numbers, boolean states, et cetera. That's all they can do. Finally, we haven't covered this at all. We will get to it when we get down to the XML schema, um, but um, elements can have arbitrary cardinality constraints, including ranges. So, you know, I can say, I want this many of this element or this many of this element, this element I, I can have as little as zero or as many as 100 or as many as unbounded, you know, essentially as many as you want. Um, I can also include rain, uh, ranges like number ranges. You know, if, if um, you're doing something with latitudes and longitudes, well, you know, they can only be zero to 360 or minus 180 to positive 180. You can define those kind of ranges in XML schema uh, for the data. However, in attributes, all you can really do is say this attribute is required, or it's optional, or it's forbidden. You're not allowed to have the attribute, and that's all you can do. So when we learn more about XML schema, you'll see that elements are a lot more powerful. Um, attributes are very simple things and can come in very handy, but they can't really do a lot. Um, sometimes people look at XML and say, well, I'm just going to do everything as attributes because um, it makes my XML smaller. Well. You can't because you're just limited to what attributes can do. Okay, so now we've this is, gets us to um, declarations and processes and instructions. So now we're talking really more about how what different tags there are and, and how they're going to go together. So now we have a good idea though about just the basics of XML. Oops. When we look at this now, we can make a little more sense out of it. We understand that you know, this is an opening tag. Now this is a long opening tag here. See how long this one is? Um, you have to search all the way down here for the, the closing angle bracket, but it, these are all attributes. These are all attributes that go along with the submission element. So, and they're important. We're going to talk about them. They're important ones to have, but we know that here's a message metadata inside. That's an opening tag. The closing tag for it is down here. Um, so that's something submission holds. We know submission's a root element. There's it done nothing is nothing surrounding it. It's the top level guy. Um, but then we can see the message metadata has a message date time inside and it's got a string. So some things have strings or other kinds of data, uh, but this is a different object. This is a message identification. Oh, it's got a closing tag down here. So it's holding this whole thing. So we can now we can make some sense. We know what the angle brackets mean. We know that those are elements. We know they're matched up in pairs um, to surround data or to surround other elements, you know, like this one, which surrounds all, um, all the metadata down here. We also know that there are attributes in some of these. And um, I go down a bit to start to hit the attributes, but here's one here. This offense object has this ID attribute here. So now we've seen attributes a little bit. And, um, and we've also seen some singleton tags. If we go down a bit, we'll see you know, here's, here's that role of person with the slash inside the opening tag, and then there's no ending tag. So those are kind of XML basics for how you make XML. Everything is nested nicely. Um, none of these things overlap, right? This victim here doesn't end somewhere 
down inside the subject. Everything's nice and organized and hierarchical. And that's you know, kind of basic, basic XML stuff. So let's get into a little more detail. So we're going to talk about XML declarations and processing instructions. So XML declaration is something that starts at the very beginning of an XML file, and it declares that, hey, this is XML. That's really what it's doing. It's shouting out saying, hey, I am XML. Here's one here. It's the very start of the submission. We can see it in the example. If I scroll up to the top, here it is in the full example. And this example really is um, the full incident with multiple offenses sample instance if you go and you download the niver stuff and you go and you ask for sample instances this is a real world one. i didn't make i mean it's not real world it's a sample instance but this is the real one of the official ones i didn't make this up so um starts with that processing instruction that's the pro i mean starts with the declaration not a processing instruction sorry and the declaration here does two things the first thing it does is it tells you what version of xml is being used so it says version, it's an attribute, it says version is 1.0, we're using version 1.0 of XML. Always going to be 1.0 because that's the only version of XML really is version 1.0. <clears throat> then it can have optionally an encoding. Actually the version's optional too, but it's a good idea to put it in there. Um, it's got this encoding and the encoding tells you what encoding is being used to define the text below. And there's really two, there's a lot of choices, but the two you're going to want to use are either US ASCII or UTF-8. So US ASCII is just the unadorned 26 letters of the alphabet, numbers, and basic punctuation, like periods, commas. Um, anything you can easily type on your keyboard pretty much falls into, into US ASCII. Um, doesn't support any accented characters or anything like that. Just plain old ASCII, nothing more to it. UTF-8 is Unicode, and Unicode support, supports accented characters. Um, tons of different alphabets are defined in Unicode. Unicode is, I mean, if you really want to look into Unicode, Unicode does some really cool things. But one of the best things about Unicode is completely backwards compatible with US ASCII. Um, so uh, the letter A in US ASCII is the, it's the same code in UTF-8. A capital A in US ASCII is the same code in UTF-8. Um, once you get beyond the ASCII characters, then UTF gets interesting. Um, but if you don't go outside of the world of ASCII, UTF-8 works perfectly fine um, because it's backwards compatible. If you're going to be using accented characters, you probably want it to be UTF-8. Uh, there's usually no harm in having to be UTF-8. So these are UTF-8. So that's all this line does. It's um, declaring that, hey, I'm an XML document. I'm version 1.0 of XML, and my text is included, encoded in UTF-8. And that's what it does. That's why it's there. Um, processing instructions. You know, I don't have an example of a processing instruction, so I'm not sure this is, this is a little embarrassing. This really shouldn't be here. Um, processing instructions are used to do things like uh, apply a style sheet to the XML so that the XML looks fancy, uh, looks pretty. Um, that's the kind of things you might do with a processing instruction. A processing instruction might say, hey, run a certain chunk of code against this to do something with it. You're not going to find these in, in um, you're not going to find these in Niver. So that's something you need to worry about and um, not something you run into a lot in XML. This is literally, I copied and pasted this from older materials and I forgot to remove this part here. Um, apologies for that. Um, but here's our example we talked about. The XML declaration is that first line, and that's really all there is to the declaration. It says, hey, I'm XML version 1.0 using UTF-8. Now, another thing to look at, and you maybe have wondered when you're looking through these examples, that there's a grayed, kind of grayed out text. These are comments. So let's look at XML and let's look at comments. XML allows for comments in the document itself. Um, and this can be really helpful for pointing out what different things are, um, especially if there are colloquial names for things um, that the element name doesn't reflect. So just a few here in our example. Inside the report header, there's a comment that says submission type because that's what the NIVERS reporting category code is. This is a mission type. Um, there's a report action category code. This is a submission action type. Um, the year month of report is the report date. And there's a bunch more. If we look in 
the example document. So, you know, what is, what is this? It's called message implementation version. Yeah, that's just the version of the IEPD. Um, what is this identification ID inside of the organization ORI identification? It's the submitting agency ORI. So NIVERSE can be full of these comments in these sample ones. You don't have to put them in, they're just comments. But um, the sample one is really good about mapping what the different things are, especially if you're used to flat file formats and things like that. Like, hey, this thing here, yeah, that's element one. Yep, okay. Um, this thing here, yeah, that's element two. And this thing here, that's element three. Now the computer completely ignores these comments. It completely ignores them, doesn't care. So you can kind of sprinkle them wherever you need them. They're totally ignored by a computer that's reading this in and consuming it. You can see, whoops, went up too high. You can see here uh, the format of these is kind of odd. It's just how XML does it. It kind of looks like a tag, only it's an angle bracket, exclamation point, dash, dash. That's the start of a comment. The end of the comment is dash, dash, closing angle bracket. It, it's really odd. I, I don't understand why it's like that, um, but that's just how it is. Um, and then go pretty much anywhere you want. You know, you could, this one's here. You could, you could put one in between here if you wanted, between the report date and the year month date. The only thing you really can't do is can't, you know, put them inside of a tag, things like that. But in between the tags, perfectly fine. You can sprinkle the comments wherever you want to. Um, you typically won't see that in real world exchanges because again, the computer doesn't care. The computer's just going to ignore it. Um, but you know, if, if you're doing something where you want people to be able to look at it and better understand it, then you put comments in. It's, 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 just like, it's just like computer code, right? The computer doesn't care about the comments in your code, but a human looking at your code certainly cares. Um, so you might want to put comments in there. But this is what they look like. They're odd. Um, this kind of color formatting, most XML editors will do this kind of formatting for you too, and that helps. And you know, they will color, they will color comments in a color that indicates that they're comments. In this case, it does it in a gray, so they're kind of grayed out. So those are comments. So if you followed all of these rules above, you followed all the rules, um, you know, you did your, you did your naming of your tags right, and you put them together correctly, and you had opening and closing tags, and where you didn't have a closing tag because there was no data, you did a singleton tag, um, you did your attributes correctly, maybe you threw comments in, you did it all right, you get what's called well-formed XML. Um, basically, if your XML isn't well-formed, it's not XML. It's just something that kind of looks like XML. Um, well-formed XML means you followed all the rules for XML, all the stuff ab above that we've covered until now. And if you've covered all that, if you've done it all right, and you have well-formed XML, then that guarantees that the computer can parse your stuff, can read through it and break it apart into pieces and make sense out of it and do things with it. So that's what well-formed means. Um, I've got a XML editor up, and this is XML schema. That our very next topic is to start talking about it. But you see, I got a button up here, and the button lets me say, "Hey, check for well-formedness." And I click on that button, and it says at the bottom of the screen, "Document is well-formed." This document follows all the basic rules for XML to be a valid XML document that a computer can deal with. But if it wasn't well-formed, um, if I change something, which I can do, like maybe maybe um, make this so it doesn't match. Well, it's gonna actually fix that for me though. If I take that angle bracket away, I'm gonna get errors. And if I try to explicitly do a well form, it's gonna say, oh, you, you didn't pass the tests. You're missing an angle bracket. I'll put the angle bracket back and now it's well formed again. I can go ahead and check the well formedness. So that's kind of the baseline. If your XML isn't well formed, it's not XML. It needs to be well formed. It's the first bar you have to cross. Now, that all sounds good. I've got well formed XML. That's cool. It doesn't mean it makes any sense because this is well formed XML, perfectly well formed XML. I've got an XML declaration at the beginning. I've got, here's a tag called. Um, Cladifast, I, I, I literally just pounded the keyboard. Opening Cladifast tag, I hope none of these sound obscene when I try to say them. And a closing Cladifast uh, element. And inside of there, there's a Afka, is this called this, I, I can't pronounce this. But you got this element, um, closing element for it here. 
here's the value of it. You've got this element in here and it's got the matching closing and it contains this one. Um, and this is an opening. Here's a closing and here's a tag that's a singleton. There's no closing tag instead of the slashes inside. This is perfectly well formed XML. Perfectly well formed. There's nothing wrong with this from an XML perspective. But it's meaningless. It means nothing. This is all gibberish. I literally, for each of these elements and values, I just smashed the keyboard and went with what came up. To add meaning to the XML, we need to start to be able to define what these element names are. We need to be able to define that this element needs to be called something meaningful. And it holds this element, and it holds this element, and those need to have meaningful names. And this element holds a string that's meaningful. It means something, and maybe it has formatting constraints on it. Maybe it has to be a positive integer. Maybe it has to be a date. Maybe it has to be a true or a false. And this has got to hold something, and this has to be me, this has to have a meaningful name, and this has to have a meaningful name, and this whole organization needs to be meaningful. And that's what XML schema is for. XML schema tells us what the tags should be called, how they should fit together, what sort of data they should hold. That's the whole idea with, um, with the XML schema. And that's the topic for the rest of the training. If you look at the scroll bar way over here on the right, you can see we're only a third of the way through, not even quite, because the XML is the easy part. Um, the XML schema is the hard part. So that's what the rest of the class is going to concentrate on is the XML schema. Um, so this is a good place though to take a deep breath. And before we move on to XML schema, you know, just take a deep breath, um, pause the video, um, get something to drink, and then we'll continue on with the XML schema part. Good afternoon, folks, and welcome back. Um, I'm, I know that the, uh, the material had a lot of in-depth information. Uh, from my perspective, I found it very valuable. I believe from those that continued with us for uh, the one plus hour session, I think they may have found it a value too. And that is what we are here for. Uh, I know that there were one or two questions that came over the, the chat room. Uh, are there some individuals that would like to uh, submit more questions now, or would you like to submit it over time? Because I can tell you both will be answered. Either we'll do that live right now, or we'll con continue to develop what is an FAQ and make it available on our websites. Just checking the uh, the chat room. I just saw one, Tom, that's coming up. Oh, yes, I see Nibers XML does not include PII. Is that correct from what I've seen? I see no PII data. Um, I am not a Nibers expert. Um, I didn't see any in the examples, so I can't really tell you um, whether it is or not. Um, so it's really beyond my ability. That is correct. I will confirm that that is correct. Okay. And we've got another I, Actually, I had, the, I had the same question um, looking at the examples. I'm like, oh, yeah, there's not a lot. Of, there's not no PII That's in not. here. Okay, yep. Um, when and where can we locate the XML schema training videos? Again, not a question I can answer. I won't be the one posting them. Um, I just recorded them. They will be available on the IGIS website. They will ultimately be available on YouTube. Uh, that is something that before the end of the week, this first segment, which we refer to as the, the basic course, um, uh, will be available to you, as well as the intermediate and the more advanced course. And that's the ones that, as you heard Tom during his narrative of the video, uh, it speaks to a part two and a part three that then gives you a greater level of detail. Okay, uh, next question, is this going to be uh, more of the same for the next hour. Um, depends on the questions. If we run out of questions, I would like to actually point to a few parts in the advanced material, uh, just so you understand a few more things that show up in the instance documents um, above and beyond just the general knowledge of XML schema, just a few things you probably want to know about. Um, that's kind of the plan, but it, it depends on um, what kind of questions people ask. Um, we're not intending to queue up more pre-recorded video uh, because it's another hour and 45 minutes worth. And um, you probably don't want to, I, I don't want to sit for that long. I didn't record it in one long thing. Um, that's just a long time to sit and listen. 
Okay, just checking to see if any other questions come in. Hey, Maria, it looks like we have a couple of folks with uh, their hands raised. Oh, so great. I'm going to unmute. If you can go ahead and on. usher them through. Sure. I'm going to give Jim an opportunity. Jim Pingle. Looks like he has oh, his hand Jim. raised. Oh, Jim. Hi, Jim. Uh, but you're muted, Jim. You talking to me? Yeah. Why? We have your hand raised. Do oh, I didn't mean to. Oh, I, okay. Uh, I'll lower my hand, but um, <laughs> good to see you, Tom. Yeah, it's good to hear from you. Uh, Jim I'll and confess I confess I'm listening to you in the background, but it's yeah, uh, that's okay. It's all coming back to me. Um, other hey, hands. other hands that are raised. All right, we've got one more. We'll see if Lori Cox has a question from Mark 43 here. Lori? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. I do not have a question. If I raise my hand, I apologize. No, not a problem. No, you have to ask one now. Okay, well then, if I see no other hands raised and I see no other questions coming about, uh, then our intention had been to close the session. And I can't do that without many, many thanks to Tom. Uh, if you didn't already deduce it from the hour long session, uh, you will certainly with the, the second and the third part of the video series, there is a great wealth of information, of detail, of resources that are available through the video itself and even through some adjunct resources uh, that are pointed to and that can be uh, made available through the IGIS website and through the NCSX website that is available uh, through the BJS hosted sites. And there is uh, there's another question in the Q&A and that is, is there a NIBR standard similar to NEEM? Um, this standard is built upon NEEM. So if um, you start looking at the various schemas for it, you'll see that there is, well, there, there's a NIBR schema um, and then there's a NIBR's code schema and there's a CGIS schema with CGIS codes. And then underneath all of that is all the NEEM stuff that provides more generic kind of elements and concepts. And so NEEM is this underlying frame, I have to lean way back to get it in the frame, this underlying um, framework that the NIBR standards are built on. So you got that framework, there's CGC stuff on top of that, and then specifically NIBR's particular exchanges on top of that. Um, it is covered somewhat in the materials uh, when you get down to namespaces. Namespaces, which are, it's an XML schema thing, but you see it in the example, there are little uh, prefixes on front of some of the elements. I gloss over it in the XML basics, but we get into it in the XML schema. So if you see NC colon in front of an element, that means it's from the NEEM core, the part of NEEM that it's generic information. If you see a J colon, that means it's from the justice domain. It's a justice oriented piece of information. If you see CGIS, it comes from um, a, a common CGIS library that NIBRS uses. If you see NIBRS as the prefix, that's the actual top level uh, schema for that particular exchange. Um, code tables, they put in a separate schema and that one has a prefix called NIBRS codes. And these namespaces are just a way to organize the elements into different contexts so that you can basically, so they can be governed separately is really the idea behind it. So you've got, excuse me, because if it were all one big thing together, then anytime you know, somebody in Neem wanted to change something, that would affect everything. You'd have to change everything. And this allows, namespaces allow for um, distributed governance so that you can have the Neem folks doing the Neem stuff here and the Nibers folks doing their stuff up here and put all the things together and know what each thing comes from. So when I see an element, not just you personally, but also an XML validating tool knows then it looks at that little prefix, uh, which is a nickname, which links to the full name in the XML schema. Again, this is in the schema materials. It looks at that to find out the actual schema to look at for the rules for that particular element. Um, so that's how it knows to, where to go and look for the rules surrounding the different elements to know how they're supposed to fit together. Um, yeah, and it's all, it's all built on Neem and Neem is designed, you probably don't know much about Neem, but Neem is a uh, platform, a framework 
for building exchanges, defining exchanges between government entities. It works federal, state, local, um, all sorts of domains from justice to emergency management to health and human services to the Department of Defense. Um, so it's a neat thing to, again, there's, there's, if, if you really want to know a lot about NEEM, um, there's eight hours worth of video on NEEM that you can watch for free. And we can make the link available for that easily enough. That's also, that's free. You can go watch it anytime you want. Thanks, Tom. I think, let's see, we ha did have a couple of others that uh, popped up here as oh, well. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So is that a NEEM or is there a different location? Okay, so I'm not sure the canonical place for the schemas for, um, for NIBRS. I went and I found a copy. Um, I don't even know where I found the copy. There is a registry repository uh, for different exchanges to find with Neem. And so that's where I went to find the NIBRS one there. Whether that is the one, one true one or not, um, I don't know, um, but that's how I found the copy. Um, the NIBRS folks would be able to make sure you get the canonical actual real world one, um, but I don't know exactly where they have it. And I'm sure that we have those links, Tom, available on mm -hmm. our website uh, via one of the programs. So uh, BJS and FBI uh, also host those, uh, many of those documents in common as well. Yep. And then we have a question about, can you remind us of an example of the prefix? So that's a great question. Let me share my screen real quick. And because I did, oh, oh but the host has to enable participant screen sharing for me before I can do that. Should be good now, Tom. Okay, cool. Let me try that again. Desktop one, that should be fine. Ah, allow Zoom to share your screen. Sorry, it's gonna take me a second. My, my Mac is making sure I do things nicely. This isn't usually a problem, but this is a new version of, um, new version of Zoom. So that's why it is not seeing it. Unclick, Ugh. unlock, add Zoom. Oh no, I have to quit and reopen. And I don't want to do that because I'll lose y'all. Um, so let me just do it. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, maybe we could provide that response in the FAQs that then yeah. well, uh, let can me just, give you the specific site and examples. Well, yeah, just question. let me walk through it real quick. So the prefixes are essentially nicknames. So, I mean, I've got a full name, Thomas Charles Carlson. It, that's, that's my full name, Thomas Charles Carlson. Nobody calls me that. Everybody calls me Tom. That's the nickname. Or if you're a close friend, you call me Tommy. But most people, they call me Tom. That's the nickname for the full name, Thomas Charles Carlson. In XML schema, you have a similar thing. You have a full name for something, and it's ugly. It looks like a URL. It's HTTP colon slash slash um, like neem core is something like release.neem.gov slash neem core slash uh, 5.0 slash. That's its full name. It's a long name. You'll see it in the examples if you watch the XML schema stuff because I cover it in detail there. Um, but that's its full name. Uh, but that's a, it's a handful. And you can actually use that full name with each element and say, here's a person element. It's from neem core. So I can put that whole name in it as an attribute. But instead, you define at the top of the schema, NC is going to stand for the whole name of Neem Core. And then you just use the NC in front of each element as you go. So the prefixes are a shortcut to be basically their nicknames. They're nicknames for these long names. So Neem Core's nickname is NC, and Justice's nickname is J, and Nybers's nickname is Nybers. But they've all got longer names. And you can find all those in the XML. Um, at the very beginning, that the main example, um, remember, had all those attributes right inside the submission. Those attributes are declaring the different nicknames and what full names they match. So we, you can go look at that example there. But again, I go into it in detail in the XML schema material. So there, it's, it's there in detail. Namespaces are really important. And I try to stress that in the materials, you'll see me stress it very, very hard um, because uh, the Nibers folks have said that people have trouble getting the namespaces right. And if you don't get the namespaces right, then, then the elements are wrong. They're the wrong elements. It's important that they be right. Uh, so you want to take a look and review that. Uh, you know, the, the thing to do is, is basically copy canonical uh, Nibers examples for that to make sure you get the naming of everything correct because it's really important that it be correct. Let's see if we've got Another question. Oh, we got thank you. You're very welcome. Um, 
The only other things I wanted to really mention, I mean, I do recommend you watch the schema materials. I know it's another hour and 45 minutes. Um, you don't have to do it all in one shot, uh, but there are a few advanced things that you'll see in the instance document, in the example that you might not understand. The big one is referencing. Um, XML schema supports referencing across the hierarchy. You saw this instance, right? And it had, it was a nice hierarchy. You had the submission at the top, you had this metadata here and the report here, and those had things underneath, all nice and hierarchical. Um, but you can go across the hierarchy in XML schema by giving some elements an ID and having other elements have a reference to that ID. So that's in a nutshell, when you see the IDs and the refs, the ID says ID equals and then some string that that just gives it a unique ID in the document. And then the ref to it says, hey, this thing is pointing to this other thing. Again, please watch the materials to get more information about that. Um, but if you don't, then at least now you know when you look at the example that this ID gives an ID to an object. And this object here with a ref equals means it's referencing this thing with the same ID. Um, that's in a nutshell. It, it's a it's a bigger topic than that, um, but that that'll get you started. How are we doing here? So we got all those. I think we've got all the questions. I Any other questions? All the questions. Yeah. So, so any parting thoughts, Tom, before I do a closeout? Um. Yeah. Please watch the XML schema stuff. Um. But again a lot of information thrown at you in a very short amount of time. Um, so feel free to, I have, you know, go re rewatch the videos when you have time. Um, you know, none of it has to be gulped down all in one go. Uh, I just will make them available for as long as you need them to be available. And, um, and hopefully it'll give you a leg up on being able to, um, being able to create correct instances uh, for Nibris exchanges. Again, XML is picky and you got to do it right. If you do it right, then it can be understood at the other end. If you don't do it right, it can't. So it's important to get the XML right. XML is picky, but it's picky for a reason. And hopefully we've given you a leg up on being able to um, be as picky as the XML requires. Thank you, I appreciate right. that. Thanks. So, a couple of things. First of all, I thank you, Tom. I know the effort that it took to pull this together. I know the value that it's going to provide to the practitioners and to the service providers uh, supporting what is the public sector domain with the implementation of NIBRS, and that in and of itself is priceless. I thank you to BJS and to FBI for supporting the NCSX program uh, since no less than 2013, and I'm just referring to what is the uh, the earliest memory that I personally have, but it was certainly for many decades that we've been making, that we collectively have been making this transition from NIBRS. Uh, thank you to RTI International, Research Triangle Institute International, who is the prime on this NCSX program. Uh, and most importantly, thank you to the public sector, to the private sector, to the IGIS community, as we refer to it, uh, for uh, being committed enough to listen to these uh, to listen, to participate, to engage in these dialogues that make a difference in how we successfully realize improvements uh, and realize an increased caliber of performance within our public sector domain. Uh, we cannot do it without you. Uh, we cannot do it uh, independently. Uh, so I thank you for your engagement. Uh, I would ask that anybody that has uh, questions of future videos uh, that will be posted on the IGES website before the end of the week, uh, to provide any questions via the info at IGES email. Uh, we will make sure to engage Tom in those responses and, as I said, develop an FAQ sheet and update it over time so that it's one current sheet that you could all refer to. So uh, thank you all very much. Have a great afternoon, and we hope to see you on our next IGES uh, Institute webinar and educational series program. Thank you. Bye.